Hello, my name is Todd Leach. I am a senior accessibility consultant with DQ Systems. I was self-taught through my personal relationships in my life, which sparked a passion for the topic of web accessibility, and I enjoy teaching the topic and growing others' understanding. If even at only a base level, so that you have an individual compassion for doing the right thing. At DQ, I have the sincere pleasure of helping companies from startups to Fortune 50 companies, governmental, educational, and a gamut in between. I help them better their web presence in terms of web accessibility. I have a little over 12 years of practical web accessibility and almost a lifetime of experience in general accessibility as it relates to physical space and true ADA. Today, you've joined this webinar because you are likely interested in what web accessibility is, does it affect you not being a .gov entity, what are the benefits and risks of doing web accessibility, where to even begin, or possibly you've heard of a recent legal case surrounding the topic. What we will cover on today's webinar is what web accessibility is, resources which exist to help you start your journey, help you to determine the methodologies that are best for you and your organization, what tools are needed on your journey, what else web accessibility improves in your business, the sustainable cycle of continuing accessibility, of course, how DQ can help, and then at the end, we will instruct you as to how you can submit questions to us after today's webinar. Without further ado, we'll just get started. What is web accessibility? Well, it's designing and developing your website so that people with disabilities can perceive, understand, navigate, interact with, and continue and contribute to the web. Excuse me. It's providing the same functionality and experience to users with disabilities as those without. When I say disabilities, we are talking about four main categories, all which use varying forms of assistive technology to help a user achieve an equal experience on the web. In our first category, the visual category, this could be blind or low vision users that are potentially using screen, reader, make, uh, screen readers, screen magnification, or possibly even using a braille display. In our auditory category, it's the deaf or hard of hearing that may require closed or open captions or transcripts for all of the rich multimedia content that exists out on our web today. This is audio files or video files. In our third category, our ambulatory or motor skill category, it's people with difficulties or inability to use a mouse that may only be using a keyboard to navigate the website or possibly even a speech-to-text software. And in our fourth and final category, it's the cognitive level disabilities. People with learning disabilities or the inability to remember or focus on large amounts of information, they may rely on thoughtful layout and organization of content, and possibly they are using an array of the assistive technologies that we've already mentioned, just depending on their cognitive level. So I always instruct people to pour their heart, P-O-U-R, into their web creations and not design something that's poor, P-O-O-R. And P-O-U-R is actually an acronym out of the W3C, or World Wide Web Consortium's Accessibility Guidelines. They're broken into four sections. The first is perceivable. Web content needs to be made available to the senses sight, hearing, and or touch. In the first, this could be something like a visually impaired user who must be able to receive information via sound or touch. This could be a color deficient user that must be able to receive information without the use of color or color cues. In our second category, operable, this is interface forms or controls and that navigation is operable by all users. The interface cannot require an interaction that any one user cannot perform. This could be functions triggered via a mouse or a gesture and are also available through the use of a keyboard alone. It also could be users that are given mechanisms to skip repetitive content or content 
that does not induce seizures. Things that don't flash or repeat in a repetitive pattern. In the you or understandable section, it's that content and interface are all understandable. This really speaks more towards the content being clear, limiting confusion or ambiguity. That it's free of unannounced pop-up windows and that the mechanisms are all available to detect errors and provide clear instruction to user when errors are fixed, just to name a few. And finally, in the R or robust, it's that content can be used reliably by a wide variety of user agents, including assistive technology. As technology and user agents evolve, the content should always remain accessible. This means that content on mobile and tablet devices also be made accessible and any of the web browsers a user tries to use. So I wanna give you a quick demo of what it is a screen reader user hears when they come to a website. First, I'll press setting level one. Save the level two. Build combo box. Home. Title combo box. Mister. Name star edit. Residential address one star edit. Residential address two edit. City star edit. State combo box. Title camera. Zip star edit. Transfer date. Date the right date. Current date. 27 June 2013. 27 June 2013. 28 June 2013. Table of the month star edit. Submit button. So many of you are going to not understand what was actually stated in this demo. And that was by design. Screen readers speech rate when usual, utilizing a screen reader is approximately 300 words per minute. The average speech rate is approximately 65 to 70 words per minute. That's about one word per second. That's typical conversational speak uh, and language that we use today. So I wanna slow that down and give you the visual of what this page was actually reading in the next demo. So here we see a DQ created called First Demo Bank and Trust. So we're going to take this image and we're going to click on the link and I'm going to bring it down into an actual screen reader's viewpoint for you. Big good demo Mozilla Firefox. Big good demo. Heading. So what I have done is I've initiated a screen reader called NVDA, utilizing the browser Firefox on a Windows environment. Now, the screen readers for use on a, a Windows base or a PC are going to be NVDA and JAWS. Those are your primary screen readers. If you're utilizing a Mac, then you would be using Safari and VoiceOver as your combination. For purposes of today's demo, we're going to use NVDA and Firefox as our combination. When we get to this page, the first thing that we heard was Deek Good Demo. What that is, is it's the page's title. This lets the user know that they've reached the page that is in their intent, that they are now going to navigate and understand what is in this page and that it is truly going to be the page that they were looking for. It's a very important and very small piece of information, but is a big impact for users. Something that a screen reader user can do is quickly determine all of the headings on a page. They can do this by clicking on their H key. Clickable pay bill heading level two. Payment information heading level two. Payment transfer amount heading level two. They can quickly see what we visually can see, that there are three sections to the main content area, pay bill, payment information, and payment transfer amount. Each of these very clearly read by the screen reader in, it, in the demo that I'm showing you. It also announces something that is not visually there, which is through context of the code that developers have put forth. And this announces that this is a heading level two. This allows the user to know that paying a bill is the secondary level heading to the overall first level that exists somewhere on this page. If they wanted to find out what that heading level one was, they could quickly do that and figure out how this page is now structured semantically. The next thing that we want to be able to do quickly is fill out the form that's available to us. So if we go backwards, payment information heading level two, pay bill heading level two, 
spill type combo box phone collapsed. With a quick couple of keystrokes, I was able to go back to the pay bill section, go to the first element, and I hear some triggers that let me know that I'm now in an area that I can control and type. And it tells me that it's the bill type combo box. Combo box indicates to me that I can open and close this container. List. Phone two of three. It tells me that there's a list and that it announces what I'm selected. Phone number two of three. This lets me know that there are two options. I'm on the second option of three options available in this list. Choose account type one of three. Phone electric three of three. And if I quickly navigate through, I can hear the association with the rest of them. I'll make my selection. Bill type combo box electric collapsed. This lets me know that the box is now collapsed. I've chosen electric and I'm still focused on the bill type section. Title combo box MR. Collapsed. Name star edit has autocomplete. Blank. In the name field, it tells me exactly what I'm supposed to put here. Under the payment information, I'm to give my name. T O D. Residential address one star and it has autocomplete. Blank. All of these features are available because in this case, we've taken the time to ensure that this page is made accessible to people with disabilities. Specifically in this test case, we're looking at it from someone who is blind and using a screen reader software. So let's continue on in our webinar, and I will close down NVDA for us. Run dialog type, desktop list, recycle bin not selected, number lock off, exit NVDA. So how did we actually create this accessible website? The best solution is through WCAG, or the World Wide Web Consortium Accessibility Content Guidelines. Web Content Accessibility Guidelines is a series of web accessibility guidelines published by the W3C. It's the standard rule set that defines exactly what makes a website accessible. You may have also heard a term called Section 508. The United States and federal government Section 508 requirements is really a legislation referred to as Section 508, and it's a common phrase knowledge that we hear in our area of expertise and business. But what Section 508 actually is, is an amendment to the Workforce Rehabilitation Act of 1973. The amendment was signed into law by President Clinton on August 7th of 1998. Section 508 requires that electronic and information technology, which is developed by or purchased by a federal agency, be accessible by people with disabilities. The 1998 version created binding and enforceable standards that are incorporated into the federal procurement process. In addition to providing more enforceable standards, the amended Section 508 established a complaint procedure and reporting requirements which further strengthened the law. Contrary to what you may read on the web, Section 508 does not directly apply to the private sector websites or to public sites which are not U.S. federal agency sites or that receive federal money or grants. Throughout the globe, there are many international standards that are being used, so we are not the only country in the United States that are actually dealing with web accessibility. Some of the countries are already more advanced and have laws protecting both the governmental as well as private sector businesses. Our neighbors to the north, Canada, have something called the Common Look and Feel Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, or for short, AODA. In Europe, across the Great Pond, they are using something called Britain DDA, which is really built on WCAG 2.0 and is very similar to that of Section 508 in the U.S., except it is now a law that covers both the governmental as well as private sector industry and business. In China and South Korea, they're using strict WCAG 2.0 AA standards. In Japan, they're utilizing something called the Japanese Industrial Standard, or JIS, which is also built off of WCAG 2.0 AA. 
in Australia and in Israel, they're using something called the Advanced Accessibility Standard. This also is built off of the WCAG 2.0 AA standards. And as we've already mentioned in the previous slides, here in the United States, depending if you're a government entity or if you're a private sector, we're looking at this from a WCAG perspective or a Section 508 perspective. WCAG 2.0, from what we're showing you across the globe, is really the global leading authority on what web accessibility is. It's the standard rule set that defines what web accessibility can do and should be internationally. Even in the US Access Board here in the US is beginning to reemerge and do all of the processing of laws to change what Section 508 really is to more closely resemble that of WCAG 2.0 AA so that we're not trying to break down both a federal and public and, uh, I'm sorry, private sector uh, requirements. We're going to try to mimic more of the global standard, which is WCAG 2.0 AA for all entities because that's where the neutrality of equality really sits. So web accessibility makes it better. The founder of the World Wide Web pictured on screen here is Sir Tim Berners-Lee. And when he invented the web, he always intended it to be an open platform for society to connect, for better communication, and to build knowledge. It was a way to get information into the hands of all, not some or a select privileged few. Building accessibility truly was his vision for bettering the globe. What can it do for your business to better your business? It betters your brand reputation. It helps meet the needs of an ever-aging market. It helps with the all-important search engine optimization, how you're found when a user does a web search. It helps improve use across mobile devices and tablets. And finally, it betters you by reducing your litigation risk. Litigation should not be the single driving force to making your website more accessible, but the looming possibility is there. And we've seen this in the industries over the years, not just any one specific industry, but many. I'm gonna put up a few of the notable decisions and settlements that we've seen in the past several years. Likely the most notable and publicized was from where I came from before coming to DQ. This is the NFB versus Target.com in 2006. But even what was a negative, Target and its employees, its partners, and all of their vendors have made and turned that negative into a positive achievement. And they continue on their mission of web accessibility as their norm in their business. A couple of the other acronyms that are out here, the ACB is the American Council of the Blind, the CCB in the case versus Rite Aid in 2008 is the California Council of the Blind, the ASB in the case where we see both Rite Aid and CVS, and also the American Cancer Society is the American Council for the Blind and the American Federation Foundation for the Blind. And then we have the NFB, as we've mentioned, which stands for the National Federation of the Blind. So some of the top accessibility mistakes that we see as experts on a regular basis, depending on any site that we look at. It's not, again, specific to an industry or um, a type of company, but rather a general mistake that's made when people are creating web content. The first is that images are often not properly marked up with alternative text for those who can't see images or separated so that only the relevant images are actually relayed to the user or conveyed. It's trapping a user inside of content of a page or not allowing a user to interact when they're not using a mouse. It's that content appears based on a user's action without any indication to those who can't see it. This could be form errors or frustration to those who can see it but can't use it, which for example would be something like a date picker. 
no knowledge of where a user is on a page when they're only utilizing a keyboard. It becomes a guessing game that can sometimes be very disturbing or 100% of an obstructive uh, element to navigating the site. And then we have tables. Those used both for design layout, which is never recommended, but more importantly, true data tables. Inside of a table, which has corresponding column and row heading associations, and they can decipher this data with ease. If we continue on, it's poor heading structures or undetermined list content where it's conveyed as a list but not structured like a list. It's using color alone to convey a part of the page. For information about this topic, see the yellow box at the bottom of the page. Those people who can't see yellow and won't know where the yellow even begins or ends is going to have a hard time finding that important piece of information. It's missing captions from wonderfully instructional or informative web experiences. It's the fatigue which can be caused by someone who can't use a mouse to repeat their steps on a global, unchanging content which appears page after page. This can oftentimes be the main element of your page, which is the global navigation, the thing that exists on every page. If you're a retail giant, those can be extremely long and very, very hard to navigate if there's a, no way for a user to skip over that content. And finally, of our top 10 mistakes that we generally see, it's that page title. That small but very important element that we saw in the demo that I provided, it's the very first thing that a user hears on a page. It's also kind of like the title to the book. What is going to be contained? And we say never to judge a book by its cover, but oftentimes titles are the intriguing thing that gets us to read. It also lets us know that this is the book that we've been looking for. So this important piece of information is something that is often missing on many of the pages that we review. So let's take that same screen reader demo that we did before. You're going to hear it as from a screen reader user's perspective. And you may or may not pick up on some of the differences, but let's give it a listen. So again, we may have heard the same thing as users attending this webinar, but to a screen reader user, this is a vastly different experience that they've just encountered. When we show the image, and I promise this is not the same image that we showed before, but it is the same page, this is the page that we would have remediated. This is the bad experience. It otherwise looks exactly the same as what we've seen in the previous demo. But this page did not take into consideration accessibility. And here I want to show you the demo of that now. Big bad demo Mozilla Firefox. Big bad demo. So again, we hear that it's the DEEK bad demo, or DQ bad demo. So I quickly now know, as a screen reader user, that I am on the page that I want to show to all of you. On this page, what I first showed you in the demo before was that we had three very succinct sections of content in the main content, and these were separated by headings. By clicking the H key, I was able to move heading by heading and determine what area of the site I needed to go to. If I do that on this page, no next heading. No next heading. It tells me there's no next heading. And why that is is because there are actually no headings on this page. The page otherwise functions for a user who is visual and otherwise able-bodied exactly the same. But to someone with a disability, this is now going to take me a lot longer to figure out where I need to go and what actually exists on this page's content. It's small things that make really big impact to users. So if I do this and I can go down to the, the actual form elements again. Button. Enter city, state, or create account link. 
Table. Row 2 pay bill column 2. Combo box phone collapsed. Now we hear that this is a table. We hear that there's a column, but we don't see columns. We don't, you know, visually witness that this is actually a table. This is where a table is being used for design purposes, but isn't being suppressed to the screen reader user. So now the user thinks that they're inside of a table. Row 4. Combo box MR. Collapsed. They also hear that they're in a combo box and that there's MR, but they aren't hearing that there's a title associated or a label to this edit box or this input field. That's title and that's missing. It's still visually there, but I don't know what it is that I'm supposed to give here. And you may think, oh, it's a combo box, it's not a problem, but then if we get into something where I have to fill out information. Row 5. Name star edit has autocomplete. Blank. Now, in this case, you're hearing name star. That's because screen readers have adapted to actually associate content that exists surrounding the fields that they're in. Sometimes this gets it right. In many cases, it gets it wrong. Being that this is a simple page design and screen reader involvement, I can promise you that in the code, there is no actual field label that exists. And all this is doing is pulling from information that it thinks it has. The other thing that's not missing here is the red outline. In form elements, we can easily determine where we are on a page because we can see the blinking cursor. And even a, a screen reader, or excuse me, a keyboard only user who is sighted can still see that. But if this was just a link on the page, they wouldn't see the focus indicator of where they're supposed to be. And maybe it's uh, so light that it might not be prominent. So there are many things within the same site that we've corrected to make it good. And again, how we did that was through WCAG 2.0 AA standards. Exit NVDA dialog. So what are some of the myths that we're presented with on a regular basis? I want to prove them wrong for most of you today. And you may or may not have heard some of these in the past or in your careers. That you have to provide a text-only version. In the experience of any advocacy group or agency, this is a myth. It's extremely false. It shows that alternate sites typically end up out of sync with the primary site and never truly provide equal access or an equal experience. But what's more damaging is, is you're telling a very specific set of users to go to a different site. And this is not too much different than what we saw during the civil rights movement when we had segregated bathrooms. We don't want to do separate but equal because really what we're creating is separate but unequal. We're getting into a more of a civil rights discussion about why it's okay to create something that's for one set of users alone. It's never okay and it's never a good idea. And in today's world of technology, nothing yet has been designed that can't be made accessible. The site can't look good and be accessible. Well, clearly that's false because, again, where I came from, companies like Target.com are still winning design awards post being an accessible entity and agency. They have won multiple design awards for both their mobile and their traditional web content. Another fallacy, that accessibility will diminish functionality. This kind of loops us back to that you have to provide a text-only version. It's untrue. Things that used to not be accessible, like sliders, that used to maybe you drag a, a little dot across a line to uh, increase or decrease volume, or increase or decrease a dollar amount, or whatever the case would be, has been able to be made accessible through wonderful technology like ARIA, A-R-I-A, which stands for Accessible Rich Internet Application. It's specifically there for users of screen reader technology to help them understand what the content is, what the component type is, and what it's meant to do. And it all can be controlled via a keyboard. Accessibility is impossible to achieve. Again, another big fallacy. Companies like Target were sued because they weren't doing it, but it wasn't impossible to achieve. In fact, over the course of the four years, uh, so from the time that they were sued until the time that they were granted the non-visual access gold level certification uh, from the National Federation of the Blind, 
This was just nothing but a work in progress of remediation. And in 2011, they created a whole new website with thoughtful accessibility layered in, which again, still bestowed the non-visual access certification. So it's not impossible to achieve. It does take work and it does take thought and planning, and we'll get to that soon. The pathway to accessibility, what does that look like? Well, the typical and basic cycle that we see is very much like what I'm showing here on screen. And when I came to Target, the development cycle for new content was very much the same. It was design, develop, code, test, launch. Target was designing great graphics and user flows. They even went as far as telling a story about the visitors they sought, the age, the income, the demographics, all of it. After they had finalized the beautiful designs, they handed it off to world-class developers, both from Amazon as well as internal of Target.com. They layered in all the great user interactions and the designer user flows were able to be achieved for that page. When they were finished, a multitude of tests were performed by otherwise able-bodied individuals to ensure that the content worked as it was designed, to ensure that it was built to handle heavy flows of traffic, the security was being met, error messaging that was intended was being handled and clearly identified, and then launch day would arrive. While post-launch important marketing statistics were being gathered, traffic that was coming to the page, what users were clicking on, how they were in, in engaging with the page, these designers and the developers and the QA teams had finished their jobs. They had already moved on to that next project without thought or repercussion of what could be happening. Target wasn't discussing that in this user flow, a certain mom was coming to their site being counted as traffic at the right income level, at the right age, all of the criteria, but that she may not be just like them. They may not access the page in the same way or with the same technologies, but would still be counted as part of their marketing and metrics. And this could actually be damaging. So Target had never discussed accessibility. Sure, they had heard of it, but it wasn't being lived as their reality. No one was championing the idea or putting measures in place to account for this subset of users that were already being counted as part of their statistics. No one was training developers or designers or ensuring that there was a success to accessibility all the way through for every guest that was coming to the site. There was no plan in place. What we quickly determined was that Target needed a blueprint. Accessibility is not a one-man show. When I came into Target, they thought maybe I was going to be the golden goose who was going to make the golden accessible site. But I was one person in a multi-billion dollar corporation and in a site that produces about 2% uh, of their overall uh, income and revenue for the company. That's a lot. You can't do it alone, and you shouldn't do it alone. You need that blueprint. You need to know what does that true architecture look like and who's going to be helping you. You need the right development tools, the right resources, and training. And then you also need to get engagement from your external and internal partners. The other team that was thought to be the team that was going to fix everything and a lot of probably what you've heard me saying in today is that it relies on the developers. Well, it's not a dev thing. It's not a flip of a switch. Those are individuals that can help tremendously in the overall process, but it cannot be relied on as the developers are the only people who can fix it. So here are a couple questions that will help you on your journey to true web accessibility. Do you have an accessibility statement on your site? Do your web design and development guidelines or standards, even your brand standards, do they include accessibility as a consideration? Have your developers, your testers, your designers, even your content creators been trained in web accessibility? Do you have an in-house expert on accessibility who can provide assistance to web developers and designers and content creators and others in the company to help them guide them in their learning and their decision making? Do you have specific tests for accessibility included in your unit testing? 
your system testing, or your user acceptance testing? How about regression and pre-release testing processes? All of that is important because we're testing for other types of users, otherwise able-bodied. These other users are being left out. Does your compliance department regularly review the regulatory and legal developments related to web accessibility and report that to senior management so that it gets part of a project and becomes part of a program overall, like what's happening at Target? Sustainable accessibility. We're going to take that same life cycle that we looked at just moments ago, design, code, launch, and test. But here you see it with an overarching process or cycle. That's because design is planning, coding is equipping and empowering. In your testing phase, you're testing and remediating. And when you launch, it's not just launch and done. It's sustaining what exists that's live to your guest-facing public. In that design phase or the planning phase, you have to plan for access you know, uh, at all the different requirement levels. You have to set a standard uh, within your organization that you're going to try to meet when it relates to accessibility. We recommend setting WCAG 2.0 AA as that standard. You need to reference your company accessibility guidelines and your testing tools. So those questions that we just recently asked are really important questions because they're going to frame up your, your basic architecture for what your program of accessibility is going to look like. It's adding accessibility into your company personas making sure that there are a group of people or individuals that have accessibility as a part of their overall metrics and performance metrics, and that they're responsible and championing the idea. And then it's also making sure that standard test cases are provided. And this isn't about accessibility test cases. We go into many companies where content is tested, but there's not an actual script. There's not a set set of rules that say what someone should be testing when they come to a website. And that's a very important piece. It's equipping and empowering your teams for accessibility and access to all the environments. It's adopting development and accessibility testing tools. It's integrating those current tools that you already are using and adopting them with new testing tools that are related to the new sets of criteria that you're now going to be testing for, which is accessibility. It's also empowering. It's giving role-specific training. The same training may overlap to developers, designers, content creators, but there are very unique pieces that we can focus on to help hone those skills of each of those different groups and teams. In testing and remediating, we have distributed unit tests. It's centralized automated tests that are happening to always kind of be looking at the health of your site. It's also ensuring that expert accessibility and usability evaluation is being done through the use of assistive technology so that you get what it is that a user is actually experiencing and not guessing. Also, automation can only take you so far. It can find a lot of the issues that can be present in code, but it cannot help you 100%. To get to that 100%, you need people. And the best sorts of people are folks like myself and others who have studied this for many, many years and understand the different assistive technologies. But the very best that you can get is user testing with people with disabilities. If you have the luxury to be able to get that opportunity, and I do say luxury, and it is a great opportunity, you get a perspective and a wealth of knowledge from those individuals about how they utilize your site that might help streamline and improve your site's usability efforts for everyone. And then finally, once it's tested and we've launched it, you have to sustain. You have to be continuously monitoring the code to ensure that if something happens or is changed on that page, you don't affect accessibility. It's also ensuring that your vendors have verification, that they're held responsible to the standards that you as an organization have set forth. And then as employees on board or off board within your organization, knowledge should not just diminish with them. That new employee training is always mentioning accessibility and that people in those facets of your organization that have an impact to web accessibility continue to be tested and trained. So 
there is a cost associated with anything that you do on your website. And many of you are probably already going, yeah, this is going to be an expensive process. Well, I look at this as free or expensive. The first being free, you know, we have to look at it as how is this really free? Well, it may not be because, again, there is a cost associated with doing anything. But it doesn't have to be expensive. In our viewpoint, web accessibility and web security are very similar in that they are both required and something that is good for business and something that money is spent on every year with every project. Once implemented, costs are not incremental to your project anymore. They are just part of the project plan, making it far less expensive or even what we consider free. Because it's not incremental to your business or to your project, it's simply a part of the business. Similarly to what designing a building is today. When a contractor comes to you after you've architected a great new home or a great new building, there isn't a line item on there for the Americans with Disabilities Act, but there were likely additional costs with ensuring that this new structure would be accessible under the law. It's a variable cost of doing business, but doing it at early stages of a site are far less expensive. A new site with knowledgeable developers, quality tools, and accessibility requirements built into your development process, that can make it far less expensive or free. But if you don't heed the warnings, we start getting into where it can get quite expensive. If you do the same process over and over and tack on accessibility as a constant afterthought, it will be quite expensive and not sustained to your organization. You will simply be setting yourselves up for failure. So be smart with your money. Don't just always be looking at accessibility as an afterthought. Don't be doing remediation of old sites. Don't train your developers. Don't get any of the, the tools that are needed to help you on your journey to accessibility. No previous accessibility requirements to a project that might already have been kicked off. Because at that point, you might be forced to fix it under that litigation, that looming possibility. And that's where it can get quite expensive. So be smart with your money. Learn the basics from an expert. Adopt an organizational standard and tools to test for compliance. Become self-sufficient. It's not a sprint. This is a marathon process. Pace yourself. Take the necessary rest stops that you need. Start prepping for the future. And here are a few next steps that you guys can take after today's webinar. Tell your developers to download FireEyes from DQ, available at no cost. And there's two links provided on how you can download and, of course, how you can get training. Review and study WCAG 2.0, but please do not be overwhelmed by its length or get discouraged. Because those of us at DQ, we've already digested it and can help you understand it. Contact your DQ office directly or a DQ sales development uh, representative if your company already has access to one or has been reached out by one. And finally, stay ahead of the ever-changing data with new stories, highlights, and happenings in the world of web accessibility. You can do all of this by signing up for regular updates from those of us here at DQ. I want to thank all of you for joining today. Um, it's been a great pleasure to bring you this topic. As you heard in the, my introduction, this is one of my most favorite things, is just teaching people a base level of what web accessibility is. And hopefully I've had you come to this with a, and leaving this with a compassion for doing the right thing with web accessibility. For a summary of all of the content that you've heard today, there is an e-guide that is available. And from the link that you clicked to actually get this presentation, please look for the link that says download the e-guide. And if you do have follow-up questions, because we're not live to you today, please utilize the Contact Us link on the same page that I just mentioned. And if you're still having troubles, you can always reach out to somebody at DQ by going to www.deque.com and click on the Contact Us link. I want to thank all of you again today and have a great day.